other institutions where I've worked. Um, in particular, at the World Bank, um, I tried constantly to remind them of the importance of uh, clarity of vision, focus, and clear principles for work. Uh, you can see why it might have been necessary to communicate some of these uh, ideas at that uh, institution. Um, the idea of comparative advantage, which I think is very important. Fundamental, actually. Comparative advantage and additionality are more or less the, uh, the same the same thing, but here, of course, it was enshrined very clearly in the method of work and the principles by which this institution operated. Now, I think climate change, which is where I'm going to focus much of what I want to say today, most of what I want to say today, is, I think, a topic where that same EBRD, if I may use that in quotes, clarity of purpose, creativity of institutions, um, precision in methods of working, and above all, international collaboration. They are together the kind of thing that drives the EBRD and the kind of thing that's going to be absolutely fundamental to a uh, serious attack on climate change. And of course, the, all these things have to be supported by um, the wish to create new ways of doing things, create a new world, if you like. That's what the EBRD was all about, and following it through friends and so on, I'm convinced that that's what the EBRD is still about. So I think the kinds of methods of work, vision, clarity of purpose that EBRD has shown is exactly what's necessary and internationally, fundamentally, to take on the challenge of climate change. And the two biggest challenges of our century, indeed the defining challenges of our century, are the management of climate change and the overcoming of world poverty. And we succeed or fail on those two things together. If we fail to manage climate change, we will create a physical environment so hostile, I'll say more about that of course, but we'll create a physical environment so hostile that we will undermine the progress that we've made in advancing living standards uh, around the world and indeed uh, create um, an environment so difficult that those living standards will inevitably move backwards. If on the other hand, in managing climate change, we appear to place obstacles in the place of rising living standards over the next two or three decades, we will not form the coalition which we have to form, which is necessary to tackle climate change. The measures we take to take on climate change cannot be measures which stop growth or retard growth. And indeed, I will argue that low carbon technology is the growth story of the future. High, high carbon growth has no future. It kills itself first on very high uh, prices for hydrocarbons, but secondly, it kills itself on the very hostile physical environment that we create. So we have to be clear that the low carbon technologies, the energy efficiency story, um, which is necessary for tackling climate change, is in fact the growth story. And to oppose it is to um, oppose growth. Um, just as General Motors didn't see the light and uh, um, got pummeled, um, other car companies, other methods of doing things which do look to the future will be the successful growth um, enterprises. That will be true of countries as well. So I'll focus on the international collaboration, but I've got to start with the basics of the problem because the whole policy story turns on the kind of problem that you have to deal with. So let me comment on that very briefly. It starts with people and it ends with people. It's, um, it's essentially 19th century science, very simple science that goes back to uh, the great French mathematician and physicist called Fourier, but um, it has been worked out and clarified and made more precise in terms of risk and probabilities with the greater information that we've been able to put together as a world over the last 20 or 30 years. But at its bottom, it's very simple science. Science that uh, those of you who've been inside a greenhouse will realize that it's warmer for a reason, that the glass traps the uh, heat. It's the same phenomenon. It's very simple, basic science. So how does it work? Well, people through their ordinary activities, their consumption, their production, their way of life, emit greenhouse gases. They emit mostly carbon dioxide, but not only. They emit more than the planet can uh, absorb. So that flow is not fully absorbed and it results in 
an increase in the stocks, the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The increase in concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere traps more heat, and that results in temperature increase, global warming. It's not particularly the temperature increases that the problem, the problem is climate change. The global warming leads to climate change, and that manifests, it manifests itself mostly in water in some shape or form. Storms, floods, droughts, sea level rise. And that, of course, changes fundamentally the environment for people and how they can go about their consumption and their production and their daily lives. So it starts with people and it ends with people in logically very simple steps. That's the structure, and it's that structure that shapes the policy. Because what is it about that structure? Well, there are a few key features. First, this is a flow stock problem. There's a ratchet effect here. Uh, once the concentrations are there in the atmosphere, they last for a very long time. It's difficult to get them out. So the later you leave it, the more difficult it becomes, because the, I'll give you some numbers in just a moment. It's a flow stock problem first. It's a global problem. The atmosphere, the uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are what counts, not whether those emissions that are built up into concentrations in the atmosphere, what doesn't, not particularly relevant, is whether they come from Johannesburg or Cairo or Beijing or Los Angeles or um, uh, London or St. Petersburg. It doesn't make any difference. What matters is the concentration. So this is a problem that is truly global. That one country can't by itself make a big uh, difference. It's only together that we can make a big difference. Many of these things are very long term. This is of fundamental importance. When we got together as a world um, at Bretton Woods in 1944, we've seen the consequences of 30 years of failure to collaborate and 30 years of bad economic policies. It was devastating. We'd seen the bodies, we'd seen the blood. That was what drove international collaboration in 1944. It drove the foundation of the European Union. The evidence from the failure to collaborate was crystal clear. What we've got to do is to be a bit wiser than that. We've got to look ahead and see something much more severe than that that will be coming. And I'll give you some of the quantities in just a minute. So this is a real test for human beings. There's no evolutionary biology that's going to help us here. What we've got to do is to look ahead and anticipate what the problems are, because this is a problem with lags. It's a problem with a long-term nature. So it's flow stock, it's global, it's long-term. It's very potentially very big, I'll describe that in a moment, and it's full of uncertainty. Each step in the chain that I described, there were five, you were counting, each step in the chain that I described has got uncertainty associated with it. This is about risk management. It's about bringing down risks. One reason why the EBRD ought to be good at this problem. This is about risk management. By acting wisely, bringing down the odds. We can't take the risk away altogether, but we can affect it very dramatically. So what about some numbers to get a feel for what's going on here? This is a very numerate institution, so you can do the arithmetic fast. Um, I think there won't be much subtraction, but there'll be some addition, multiplication and division. We start at 435 parts per million roughly where we are now. We were at 280 in the middle of the 19th century, and that'll be my benchmark for increases. We're around 435 now, and we're adding about two and a half parts per million a year. That two and a half is going up. The amount we're adding each year is rising. Um, if we didn't do very much, um, we would average over a century well over 